Our speakers for the next talk are going to be um, Igor Sochinski and Nikola Korner. Um, both of them do reverse engineering for, uh, for fun and for living. Um, Nikola wrote a couple of Python scripts to um, disable the Intel management engine um, and is studying electrical engineering at the University of Milano. And today is going to speak about um, Intel management and, um, and lay out research and facts for a lot of myths that were traveling around the world and around the internet for the past year, I would say. All right. Please welcome them with a big applause. Test, test. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you everyone for coming. That's quite a lot of people. It's the first time uh, I speak with so many in front of him, but it's, we'll see. Anyway, just a little bit about me. Yeah, I'm a software developer at a little company called Hexrays, but in my free time I do some reverse engineering, and so it happens that uh, the company develops the software for reverse engineering. So that's a bit of a good fit, I think. I'm not a security researcher, so, so my, my day job is uh, just software development. So this is just my hobby, so to speak. But as my hobby, I did a bit of hacking of e-readers. This is uh, Amazon Kindle, the first version, the ugly one. Yeah, I did a bit of, of plugging back then. Yeah, this was, uh, I, was fa I found the serial port and then did some extracting file system. Anyway, it's not related to this one, just, just a bit of background. And then I get interested in me and uh, the result is this talk. Hope you'll find it interesting. I'm uh, Nicola Korna. I do hobby reverse engineer and I'm interested in do-it-yourself hardware. I'm currently an electronics engineer student in the Politecnico di Milano, and I'm not a, research, a security researcher. I like to build my own stuff from scratch, and I really like PCB milling like this one. Okay, yeah, just a little disclaimer that uh, all that we describe here is information either from public sources or from our own first engineering. Of course, as always, uh, you can be sure that everything that we say is 100% is, is correct. It's just our opinion, and it may turn out wrong in future. And we don't have any NDAs with Intel or any special relationship, so everything we, st we, tell, we, we say is not uh, uh, endorsed by Intel or, or anything like that. Okay, let's go on. So just a little bit about what is Intel and me. Yeah, ME is, uh, nowadays it, it means management, manageability, management engine, but originally it was called manageability engine. It was quite a big thing in early 2000. Uh, then, uh, if, a bit later, now, now Intel tends, tends to call it converged security and manageability engine, or just converged security engine. So depending on uh, which generation or which document you're reading, it may be called different things. But it's basically all the same thing. And uh, in mobile or embedded platforms, there is a variation called Trusted Execution Engine, or TXE. It's a little cut down and smaller firmware, but it's also a similar thing. And in servers, uh, server platforms, Intel server platforms, there is also a version of ME running a different firmware called Server Platform Services. So basically, most Intel platforms nowadays, they have some variation of it. And what is, it, what is as a, well, Intel, Intel says this on their frequently asked question page. Built into many Intel chipset-based platforms is a small low-power computer subsystem which performs uh, various tasks. Uh, yeah, I cut some, some things because it didn't fit. Tasks during uh, uh, 
while computer is uh, running or during sleep, and so on. It must function correctly to get the most performance and capability from APC. So it's a bit vague, but that's what they say. And yeah, what other people say? Yeah, for example, some people say that it's a backdoor made for, for NSA, and uh, it has no useful purpose. And of course, I guess you can blame me as well, because my first presentation on this topic was called Rootkit in your laptop. Yeah, just a bit of explanation about it. Uh, when I submitted the abstract, at the beginning I was looking just at the anti-theft feature that Intel was uh, using back then. And that one did indeed worked like, like a rootkit. But in the process, yeah, I have this a bit of, uh, of habit that I get easily distracted. And uh, once I started looking at, at, in, at, at this anti-theft, I found that it's implemented in the Intel ME. And then from there, it's uh, kind of all, all, all kinds of things open. I start looking into what, what else in that, in that ME and so on. So anyway, uh, my point is that it's not necessarily a rootkit. It's, it was just uh, kind of maybe a bit of clickbait title to get my submission su accepted, which I succeeded. Uh, yeah. So anyway. And uh, there is, for example, article from Hackaday. It's a bit uh, difficult to read, I guess. So I, I, will, I will read uh, some of it. Uh, it says, among other things, uh, it's a microcontroller which has direct access to everything in a computer. Every computer with an Intel chip made in the last few years has one. And if you are looking for a perfect vector for attack, you won't find anything better than the ME. It's the scariest thing in your computer. And this fear is compounded by our ignorance. We, no one knows what ME can actually do. And without being able to audit the code running on the ME, no one knows exactly what will happen when it's broken open. Yeah, so anyway, this is just one article, but there were many similar articles in the recent years, and so on. So for example, on Reddit, there was this, uh, this discussion. And, and one post says, the conspiracy theorist in me also makes me believe that Intel is not entirely responsible for the ME. I imagine that NSA and other tri triple letter agencies have had their fair share of responsibility for it too. Well, of course, it's Reddit. Who knows who is posting it? Yeah, another example on Foronix forums. The US government can still make demands of what it should or shouldn't contain. The US government has a long-term plan to control the entire internet. The ME is, of course, part of that plan. Or in IRC, just a random channel, and some guy says, yeah, there was a discussion about limiting risks uh, with ME, and uh, the guy replies, how can I limit my risk when there is a dedicated hidden computer on top of a computer that has full access and can be disabled? There is no need for a hardware card. It's a built-in hardware breakdown. Bypasses any firewall, latches on to any Wi-Fi signal, cannot be disabled, and so on. So yes, that all sounds pretty scary. But is it all of this true? So in my opinion, after looking at this all the thing, I, I think that most of this uh, kind of scary things are quite far-fetched. And uh, just to answer part of, of the first uh, question, that is it has no, no useful purpose. And uh, I say, no, it, it does have purpose. Just because per it personally has no purpose, that you don't see a purpose, doesn't mean that there is no purpose. Uh, so initially, ME was created to implement uh, something called AMT to solve real IT problems. And let's see what are those problems. So just a bit of history on the remote management. So in the late 90s, there was, it began with when people had many computers, but uh, they didn't want to have monitor or keyboard for each one of them. They had something called keyboard video switch, or later keyboard video mouse. Then later uh, yeah, uh, appeared the standard called wide for management, which included, among other things, wake on LAN and pre-boot execution environment, which are still in use over nowadays. Then IBM introduced alert on LAN that allowed uh, the network card to send various alerts in case something happens with the computer. But it was just one way. 
Then in 2001, Intel introduced alert standard format one, which allowed to send some more things, but it was UDP only and uh, it had no encryption. Uh, two, two years later, they added encryption and improved some things, but it still well, was not completely enough for many purposes. And just, uh, yeah, in, in the background, they did uh, some research with many uh, enterprises, and they announced something called AMT in 2004 on Intel Developer Forum. And uh, in one presentation, they showed this picture that we have new technology which allows all this and ASF allows only this. And of course, anyone in enterprise who sees this picture, he, he sees all this green and says, they think that's really good, really good thing, I need to have it. And it was very popular. So one year later, they, they released it. First version had the uh, um, processor in, hidden inside the network card. Well, not, not card, but network uh, chip, which was on the motherboard. It had uh, features which were not supported by uh, previous one, by, by uh, alert standard format, ASF. For example, it had ID redirection, so you could uh, mount an image over the network and boot the remote computer over it. It had serial over LAN, so you could have serial console. Yeah, for some reason they used SOAP API, so XML over HTTP, but that XML was a thing back then. Yeah, then they, uh, they, they started uh, working on it, improving it. It was very popular. And they decided, why do we need to put it in the network card? Let's put it inside the North Bridge. We have some space. It's just a synthesizable core. It's, it's not a big deal. And uh, more platforms can have it. Then they did some more improvements. Uh, for example, in 2007, they started releasing the first variants of this firmware without AMT to support mo first mobile users. For example, QST is uh, quite, system, te quite uh, system technology, I think. Uh, basically, fund management. Uh, so when uh, the processor gets hot, it tells uh, the embedded controller to turn on the fans so it, it gets a little colder. So basically, it's something that works without involvement of the main CPU. And I guess they just had uh, some spare space and they decided we can have, add this feature and it will really improve the work of our hardware, so why not do it? And they also added TPM because uh, people started, well, not people, but standard, uh, yeah, there was this uh, initiative by Microsoft, the Trusted Computing, and TPM uh, standard appeared and uh, they decided why, why people need to, to have an extra chip and uh, spend, spend more money when well, we can just add uh, it inside and uh, it will be cheaper for people and uh, so on. So, and then they added the, the first version of anti-theft. I didn't look at it, but uh, that's the first time it appeared. Uh, then in 2009, they, they moved to so-called, uh, we, we call it generation two. They switched to, to a different CPU, to a more efficient instruction set, and they added also KVM support. So previously, what, what, what had to be done in hardware, using external uh, switches, now it could be done over the network. So you could have full control of, of the computer, like uh, see the video, uh, use the mouse and keyboard, and so on. They used the version of VNC protocol. Yeah, anyway, just some milestones. They're not really interesting, I guess. I'll skip them. So, uh, so the summary is that originally it was created for this uh, AMT, Advanced Ma Management Technology, I think. Uh, or what, what they called it, V-Process umbrella term, which is not really concretely defined. But eventually, they, they, they also added other features, which, which were not related to AMT, but uh, just because they could be useful and uh, they had the opportunity. So they added many things. For example, one I didn't mention is ICC integrated clock control. So previously, you, you, you had to have a separate chip on the, on the motherboard, which was responsible for controlling the clocks. 
Now it could be integrated all in the chipset, and uh, as again, uh, the customers saved on the on the bill of materials, and uh, it was also a bit more secure because uh, once the clocks were set, they were locked and uh, they could not be controlled uh, by other software in, inside the OS, so you couldn't overheat your computer accidentally. Here, of course, anti-theft was added, uh, also part of it. Then the dynamic application loader for, uh, for the applets, uh, they implemented uh, the one-time password, for example. And one feature I think was that they really liked was silicon workaround capability for, uh, for patching bugs in hardware that previously had, they had to replace the entire chips and uh, nowadays they could just release a new firmware and uh, the bugs would be fixed. So that's, I guess, their uh, kind of motivation for all of these things. So I think uh, it's kind of reasonable that they, they added this to ME because uh, they had the opportunity and uh, it saves them the money and uh, their customers. And uh, when for people who say that it was NSA and uh, they controlled by the NSA, then uh, as you know recently that uh, it was discovered that on request of government agencies, Intel added uh, the bit uh, that would allow to, to disable ME early so that it doesn't run for the rest of, of the operating uh, period of your computer. And then uh, if they had control over the Intel, why would they request this bit? It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense in my opinion. And here's a post from, uh, from one guy on Hacker News and he claims to be an Intel engineer. It's unfortunately a bit hard to read. And he says, I worked at Intel on ME for, for, for three years and I can tell you two things. And he was not born out of desire to spy on people, nor was it, to, to the best of my knowledge, created at the request of US government or others. It was an honest attempt at providing functionality that we believed was useful for these admins. Uh, it was initially to be going much worse. Early pilots with actual customers, such as a large British bank, were going to run a lot more stuff, think a full JVM and have a lot more direct uh, access to the user land. Security concerns scrapped these ideas pretty early on. In retrospect, I personally believe the whole thing was a bad idea and everybody is, feels okay to feel, is free to crap on Intel for it. But the thing was never in that as a backdoor or anything like that. So I, I kind of totally agree with this guy. So I think it's kind of uh, something that uh, kind of spun out of control and it was not really meant to be uh, as bad as uh, as it turned out. So uh, a bit uh, more about other myths. So people say that it's always on when uh, the PC is off. Well, it's kind of true, but uh, it, it has some, some circumstances. So just a little bit about ME power states. Um, so when the PC is on, ME is also working and everything is fully powered. But when the PC is sleeping, ME can, can be in different states, and for example, one of state is called M1. So main CPU is suspended, but ME functions. It has, access, it, it has a, a bit of RAM which is, which is working. It has access to the RAM and ME systems are working. And uh, uh, once uh, uh, some timeout expires, it goes to the off state. And in that case, in, it, it's completely powered off. So it works for a bit and then it goes off. But it can uh, have so-called wake mode. So when the packet comes over on the LAN and AMT is active, it wakes up and can handle the request. So it's uh, kind of off, but not completely off. But anyway, it's... Uh, when you power down your computer, usually it's off. In some uh, cases, you can configure it in the BIOS if you have AMT. Here's a picture you can, you can configure that it, it, should, it should be only on in when the computer is on or when the computer is in the sleep, it can be also be powered if it's on IC power and so on. So this uh, setting depends on, on your system and uh, sometimes it's configurable, sometimes it's not. So another one, uh, it can lock uh, the PC with a common servant over there. Yes, it was kind of true, it's for some time, but it's not anymore. 
So first you need the ZME, which has this TDT, which means self-deterrence models of anti-theft. And it was only present in the ME since 4.9 to 9.0. In 10, it was removed. And uh, for this to be possible, the anti-theft needs to be enabled, and your computer needs to be enrolled in the anti-theft program, because it has to be periodically pinging uh, the server uh, that uh, this, the PC is not stolen. And yes, uh, it had, uh, for a short time, it had support for 3G, and these 3G chips had to be connected directly to the chipset. For example, if you had a USB key with 3G, it wouldn't work only with the built-in module. And this command to turn off, uh, to, to kind of break the PC had to be signed by the Intel. So it had to, to go through Intel servers to be really active. And eventually in 2015, Intel, uh, Intel removed it and uh, it's completely gone. So it's not present in, in the modern PCs. And all the other sol anti theft solutions which are offered, they don't use ME. They all use a, a, a BIOS or UFI module, which works on the operating system level. So it's a software agent. Yeah. So another one. It can read all that on my PC. It's a, it's a bit complicated. So it can, it can read the, the host memory. So for example, it cannot read your hard drive directly. It can maybe patch some driver or whatever that it would uh, cause the data to be read from, from hard drive and then fetch the data from the RAM. But uh, it cannot access the hard drive directly, as, as far as, as I know, of course. And uh, according to the documentation in the, in the book uh, about ME, the sensitive areas are blocked from those reads. So for example, the SMM is, is blocked and cannot be read by this uh, DMA engine. Uh, it has a bit of access to the internal GPU, but as far as I know, it has, it has no actual read access to the pixels. So it can kind of redirect data from, from, from the Intel drivers to the GPU and, and do the key exchange, but it cannot directly decrypt the data. However, there is a bit of uh, footnote, so to speak. It can emulate the ID or USB device on the host, so it could boot a different image. Well, the admin could boot a different image using AMT, and then, of course, you could access the file system or whatever. But this is not directly ME itself. It's something that uses ME. And one more note that this is all about generation two of ME. So in, in ME 11, Maxim was talking yesterday, and he claims that it has access to more devices on the host. So, so maybe this situation has changed. So I don't know. So it can read some, some stuff, but uh, not everything. And then people say it's a black box, we can't audit it, just give up. And I say not really. So for example, there is a tweet from Daniel Bilar on, on Twitter, and he quotes his friend who says, it was uh, the follow-up to the crack attack, which was basically a uh, bug in the, in the implementation of the specification. And he says, whenever you have a specification, how do you break it? So read the specification RFC. Every time it says must, check that they really did this. Every time it says must not, check that they did not. Every time it says should, assume that they did not do it and test for it. Every time it mentions a requirement that does not affect functionality, assume so it was done wrongly by at least one company and nobody noticed because it still works. So anyway, I think this thing also applies, like, well, for Intel, you don't really have specifications, but you have some documentation which describes various flows, for example, for activation, for enrollment, enrollment and so on. So you can also do the same thing. Just follow those specs and, uh, and see if they really followed correctly and maybe you can find uh, some bugs. And, uh, and in addition, there is black box auditing. So plenty of products uh, can, can be audited without source code and audited without source. And just uh, as a kind of point to the, my previous slide, there is a master thesis by Vasilios Ververis in, in 2010 
called security variation of Intel's active management technology. So all, all his work, it did not involve any reverse engineering. He just read the documentation provided by Intel, and he tried uh, to, acti to activate Intel ME or, well, not AM ME, AMT, and see if it's really activated the way they describe. And he tried to find some kind of holes in that specification, and he did find some things, which were, of course, which were fixed later by Intel, but at that time they were really kind of bugs. For example, Intel says that AMT should not be uh, pinging the activation server before it goes to into step mode. But uh, Vasilos, he found that in some cases it, it does ping the activation server. So apparently uh, it was not completely implemented correctly by Intel. And in, in the later versions, Intel changed the way the activa MT activation works, and now it's more correct. So uh, you don't have to, to have the source code to I uh, sometimes even reverse engineer to, to just audit. And uh, even if you don't have source code, you have the binary code. So the firmware is available on Flash. It's not encrypted for now. So you can just figure out how to extract it, just disassemble the code and see what it does. And in my opinion, so it's a superior approach. So when you have the binary code, you see what is actually being executed. So you don't see the comments, you're not confused by comments, by, by the variable names or whatever, or code formatting. Like remember the go to fail that Apple had in their encryption code, not encryption, I don't remember, something with, with keys. Anyway, there was a go to which was indented a bit wrongly, and it was not obvious when you just glance at the code. So when you, when you have it in binary, it's, it's kind of hard to miss such things. Yeah, and you don't have the comments, but sometimes comments, they, they tend to go stale, and they may, ex they may describe things which are not really true anymore. And with the binary, it's a bit harder. Yeah, one downside, of course, it's, it's much, uh, it takes a lot of more time. But that's life. And so, just uh, to summarize, uh, there were some bugs uh, that, that we found until recently. And just, just mentioned previously, this is by Vasil Cerveris. He found some issues by, by just monitoring the network during the activation process and, uh, and trying to, to, to change some things. Then the other uh, vulnerability that was found this year, earlier this year, uh, about the empty digest that could be sent to, to, to log into the MT. And that one was found just looking at the network, network traffic again and, uh, and trying things. So without source code again. And uh, the last one uh, with uh, buffer overflow, again, was found without source code, just by decompiling the, the binary code. So just to summarize, even if it's black box and you don't have source code, you can audit it. And maybe you can even get by without reverse engineering. Of course, it's better with reverse engineering, in my opinion, but you can try without, and it might work. Now. One more thing. Uh, you can write an undetectable rootkit for it, stealthy and undetectable. And indeed, uh, there were some attempts of making rootkits for the generation one ME. In particular, in 2009, at Black Hat, there was a presentation by Invisible Things Lab. It was probably the first one, the first research on, on, this, on this topic. They found a bug in some BIOSes, which allowed access to the Intel's uh, memory area. And at that time, it was uh, just plain text code, so not protected, not anything. And they could inject some code into ME memory and execute their code. So this allowed them to, to, to kind of have a rootkit-like thing. But it has some disadvantages. It has to be reinfected on each, on each reboot. And, uh, and since then, Apple, uh, sorry, not Apple, Intel fixed it. They implemented integrity checking, so you cannot longer do this thing. All modifications will be detected and rejected. The, the machine will reboot. Uh, then there was uh, Patrick Steven, who, who made some, who, who wrote a book on detecting DMA attacks. So I think it's not, it can't be considered undetectable anymore. So you can detect uh, DMA by some side effects. And it's not so stealthy uh, anymore. 
And uh, some people say, okay, it's, it's that thing, it's there, and you cannot remove it, and you cannot do anything. So I think it's a myth. Let's see what, what can be done about it. So about uh, one year ago, I started playing with Core Boot, and I asked myself uh, if I could remove the Intel ME firmware. And uh, unfortunately, the Liberboot FAQ page had the answer. And it seems that uh, before version 6, uh, it was possible to disable Intel ME just by removing uh, the firmware from the spy flash. Unfortunately, this isn't uh, available anymore because starting from uh, version 6, uh, if you remove uh, the Intel ME firmware, uh, the PC will turn on and uh, will turn off av after 30 minutes. So, it seems that uh, it is not uh, technically required, it seems like an artificial lock. So I started looking for a way at least to reduce its firmware. And I found uh, this message on the core boot mailing list by Trammell Hudson, in which uh, he tried to remove parts of the Intel ME firmware, and uh, he found out that uh, the PC still turned on without turning off uh, after 30 minutes. And uh, in a few days, uh, he found out that he could actually remove parts of Intel ME without uh, compromising the correct boot of the system. So I tried to do his work again. And uh, to avoid uh, doing uh, things by hand with an X editor, I started writing ME Cleaner, which is a Python script able to reduce an Intel ME firmware image to the minimum image needed for a correct boot of a PC. So first of all, where's the Intel ME firmware? Where is, it, where is it located? It is located on the same chip as the BIOS UFI. So reading and writing it uh, is quite simple because you can either use an external programmer, which can be a cheap Linux board with an SPI interface or a dedicated programmer, or in some cases, you can also use the vendor tools to flash the BIOS to dump and write again your modified image. Now, this is possible because the spy chips in the Intel systems are partitioned. So this is the scheme. You have the Intel flash descriptor, which contains different partitions inside the SPI chip. So we have the descriptor region, which uh, is like a partition table, and then different partition, for example, the BIOS region and the Intel ME firmware region. All we want is the Intel ME firmware, so we just have to extract it, and we can do it with the help of IFD tool from the Core Boot project. So, first step, Let's try to remove every partition from the firmware except for the FTPR, which seems to be the fundamental one needed for the correct boot. Indeed, the Intel ME firmware is partitioned. This is the simplified scheme. So we have an FPT, which is the firmware partition table, which contains a list of the partitions inside the firmware image. In this image, we can see that there is the FTPR, which is the core partition, and the NFTP partition, which is the partition with the network stack and AMT. Removing this partition is quite easy because inside the FPT, we have these entries, and each entry has the offset and the size. So all we have to do is just to remove the code from the offset to the offset plus the size. The partition are signed, but they are signed individually, so we can remove the whole partition without any major effect, because the signature was inside the partition, so we remove both the code and the signature. Moreover, the FPT is not signed, it just has a checksum, so it's quite easy to remove everything we want. So I tried it, I flashed back the result on my PC, and it worked. So this was the first step. The next step was to try to remove the LZMA modules. Now, things are becoming a bit complicated, so let's review the uh, layout of uh, the Intel ME firmware. So we have uh, the SPI chip, uh, which contains different regions, for example, the descriptor, the BIOS, and the ME region. Inside the, the ME firmware, we, had, we have uh, different partitions, for example, the FTPR and the NFTP, and inside each code partition, for example, the FTPR, we have different modules. The modules can be either Huffman compressed or LZMA compressed. 
they used two different kind of compression schemes because LZMA offers better compressions, but it needs a loaded firmware to be used. On the contrary, Huffman compress, has a worse compressor, compressor ratio, but can be done directly by the hardware. So they use Huffman to compress the early stages modules and LZMA for the later stages. So different partitions have different structures, but uh, since uh, we kept only the FTPR partition, we are only interested in that, and that is a code partition. Moreover, the internal structure of the, uh, of the partition changes between the different uh, Intel ME generations. So generation one is not of our interest because uh, Intel ME could be removed completely, so no problem for us. And uh, let's focus on generation two because I started from that. So this uh, is the internal scheme of a generation two code partition. So we have a section that is a manifest which contains the RSA signature of the list of the modules. Here you can see that we have different modules and each entry has the name, the offset, the size, the compression type, and most important, the hash. This means that uh, the modules are not directly signed. Each module is hashed and the list of the hashes is then signed. Luckily for us, the hashes are lazy evaluated. So invalidating a hash of a module doesn't prevent the loading of a previous one. This is important because uh, it means that, you can, that we can stop the boot of the system by invalidating a module. All the subsequent uh, module will not be loaded, but the previous one are okay. So I tried again. I updated ME Cleaner and I tried to remove every partition in the FTPR LZMA compressed. So that uh, only five modules were kept. I flashed back the result and it worked again. So at this point, I had removed most of the code, but there were still the Huffman modules, and I wanted to remove at least most of them. The documentation online for the Huffman modules were very poor, so I relied on the source code of Anafmi, which is a decompressor for Intel ME Generation 2 for the Huffman modules. And I recovered this structure. So, while the LZMA modules uh, were just a single block of data from the offset to the offset plus the size, the half uncompressed modules are fragmented. So there is a single uh, partition share half stream. And we have an LLUT, which stands for Local Lookup Table, which contains a list of entries that has a valid flag and the offset. The offsets point to the Huffman chunks, which are a fixed size, uncompressed data, but from our point of view, since we're seeing only the compressed data, they are variable size. This, uh, let's say, complex scheme was probably uh, used by Intel to uh, further shrink the Huffman compression, because in this way, different chunks can be reused uh, again in different modules. However, once I understood the structure of this, uh, all I had to do was to create a whitelist of the modules that couldn't be removed because they, uh, be, they are part of a partition of a module that I, want, I don't want to be removed and remove all the others. So I tried uh, to remove the module with a less important name just to start, which was uh, FTCS, and I flashed back the result, and it worked again. So I moved on and I tried to discover which modules were really needed for the boot. And I found out that only two modules were needed. These two modules were the BUP, which stands for Bring Up, which is the, mod the first uh, loaded module, which uh, initializes all the system and turns off the 30 minutes watchdog. The ROM P, part, the ROM -P module, uh, which is uh, not always present, seems to contain uh, some sort of configuration data read by BUP, but uh, it's very small, something like two kilobytes, so not a problem. Interestingly, uh, there is no kernel now, because the kernel module has been removed. 
So it seems that uh, on generation two, it's possible to have uh, a fully functioning uh, uh, PC without a kernel running in Intel AMI. So next step, uh, recover the free space. Why? Because uh, I was using core boot uh, and the Intel AMI uh, firmware image uh, was something like five megabytes while the code remaining after the removal was uh, much, much less. And I wanted to recover that space because uh, I wanted to store a Linux uh, kernel directly inside my spy chip. Why not? <laughs> so I started just by truncating the image just after, let's say, the last valid module. And that worked. But well, that, uh, that was uh, expected because uh, the space that I had removed wasn't mapped by anything inside Intel AMI, so I could easily remove it. But that, was not, that wasn't enough because, uh, let's see for example this scheme. Between the FPT, which is at the beginning of the ME image, and the FTPR, which is our partition that we must keep, there are maybe other partitions that I had previously removed, and now they are not there anymore. So I have the FPT, something like one megabyte of FF, and then finally my code. And I want to re recover that space, so I have to figure out how I can move the partitions. And you may say, well, uh, it's easy, you just uh, move the code, you correct the entry inside the FPT, the offset of that entry, and that's all. Unfortunately, on generation two, it's not possible because, uh, uh, well, it's not that easy because uh, it seems that uh, some uh, offsets inside the FTPR partition are not relative to the beginning of the FTPR partition, but they are relative to the FPT. So you can't move the code without adjusting them as well. It took a bit of time, but uh, I was able to find them out, and uh, luckily they aren't signed. So after many tries and uh, breaking my laptop many times, I found out which uh, ones uh, were the responsible for this behavior, and I corrected them as well. I flashed back the result, and it worked again. So, this is the current uh, situation. Starting from a five megabytes image, we have now an 84 kilobyte image, which is uh, moreover full of uh, free space because as you can see, there is the FPT padding, just the header and some pointers, padding again, 50 kilobytes of data, which is the real data, and then padding. So starting from five megabytes, now we have, let's say, 50 kilobytes. And just to have an idea, this uh, is the size comparison of uh, my image. So you can see that most of the space is uh, dedicated to the network stack and to Intel AMT. We have a small partition of FTPR plus a small partition of EFFS, which is an internal file system that Intel AMI can read and write. And inside the FTPR, the only thing that we really need for the correct boot of the PC is that BUP plus, uh, sometimes the ROMP, but uh, it is very, very small. So I decided also to port my work on generation three. Now, don't uh, start leaving the room uh, saying, oh my God, it's starting again from the beginning. No, with generation three, it was much, much easier because the internal structure of the partition uh, have changed. Without any change, I was able to remove all the partitions except for FTPR because the structure was the same. But the internal scheme of the partitions had changed. And this one is the new internal scheme of the code partitions. Now they are indexed by the code partition directory, the CPD, as depicted in the picture. In the picture. So we have three different types of entries which are the name of the partition dot man, which is the old manifest plus the extensions, a module metadata and a module data. As you can see, also the signature scheme had changed. So there is the old module manifest that signs the extensions, that's, that hashes the kernel metadata, that hashes the kernel data. 
But luckily for us, the uh, lazy evaluation of the hashes is still valid. So we can exploit again the lazy evaluation to remove as many code, as uh, many partition, uh, sorry, as many modules as possible. So this is the, the list of the types. So I tried again. By trial and error, I figure out which modules were really needed and which one were not. And it seems that only four modules are really needed. So syslib, RBE, which is uh, uh, sometimes a very small partition, like uh, the corresponding of ROMP, the kernel this time, and the BUP partition. After weeks, uh, some weeks later after my work, uh, the positive technologies researcher shared the discoveries of a method able to disable intermi. So they confirmed my work, and they found a nice uh, bonus, let's say, which uh, was that uh, Intel ME generation 3, so starting from uh, Intel ME 11, which is Skylake, has a kill switch, which is the HAP bit. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the HAP bit, I suggest you to read the blog post. Here, I just uh, tell you that uh, it's a bit you set this bit to 1, Intel ME turns off just after the system uh, initialization, just after the run of the BUP module. Igor Skoczynski, moreover, found a different bit, the alt ME disabled bit, which, should, with, uh, which uh, should achieve the same result, but on generation 2. So we have uh, two different bits, one on generation 2 and one on generation 3, that are able to soft disable our Intel ME without trying to modify the code. So the final result is that uh, a combination of uh, HAP bit and alt ME disable bit is able, plus the code removal, is able to completely turn off uh, Intel ME just after the hardware initial initialization. Moreover, uh, the, these two bits uh, force Intel ME to turn off and report uh, a sane status to the system. So it seems that it is uh, better supported by commercial BIOS implementations. Moreover, to check the status of Intel ME, I used the Intel ME tool, a tool from the Core Boot project, to retrieve the status of Intel ME. So here you can see its output with uh, uh, on a ThinkPad X220 with the sole code removal. So for example, you can see the error code, which is image failure. So it tried to load a module, but that module uh, uh, hadn't a valid uh, hash. And you can see that uh, the firmware init complete uh, has not uh, been uh, completed. <laughs> and the current progress phase is the BUP phase. Intel ME is stuck trying to load the kernel, but uh, it can't load the kernel because the kernel is not uh, correctly hashed. With the addition of uh, the alt ME disable bit, you can see that uh, the status of Intel ME had changed, and now the progress state is uh, ME disabled. So different states, but the result is the same. Moreover, uh, thanks to the testing performed by the community, uh, I found out that uh, ME Cleaner is not uh, limited to my PC, but works uh, on any PC from Nihon to Cofilix. So the current uh, line of Intel uh, products are covered by ME Cleaner. As you can see, the firmware size, if you want to retrieve the space, uh, is greatly reduced, so we go from 1.5 megabytes or 5 megabytes, depending on the Intel ME firmware, to 84 kilobytes for generation 2, and uh, from 2 megabytes or 6.6 megabytes for generation 3 to 330 kilobytes. Many, let's say, unwanted features are now gone, so on generation 2, on generation two there is no kernel running anymore. We lose uh, the NFTP, so no more network stack or AMT for um, Intel ME. The dynamic application loader is gone, and uh, the platform trust technology, which is the firmware TPM, is gone. OK, mm, something bad uh, can happen sometimes. So 
on many PCs, uh, and this depends only on the uh, firmware implementation of your PC, you can have a brick so that the PC doesn't turn on at all. No way. You can have a slight uh, boot delay, so some seconds uh, before the screen turns on. On some uh, BIOSes with uh, dual BIOS uh, feature, there is an automatic rollback of the ME Cleaner modification. So you flash ME Cleaner, you turn on the PC, and you find that the ME firmware inside your SPI flash has been uh, uh, downgraded to the previous version. And sometimes you can also see these uh, warning messages. Uh, so careful, your uh, Intel ME firmware is damaged. Press F2 continue. Uh, some features that uh, someone uh, can uh, like are now gone. So first of all, uh, you can't have overclocking with this uh, kind of removal because the ICC partition, which uh, was uh, one of the modules removed by ME Cleaner, is now gone. You don't have, uh, obviously, Intel M AMT anymore. You don't have uh, Intel PAPV, which is the protected audio video path anymore. So some kinds of DRM may be broken now. And uh, some parts of Intel SGX are gone, plus other stuff. Now you may say, OK, this is good, but uh, I want to see some proof. Well, first proof, uh, you're seeing these slides. They are my PC. My PC doesn't have uh, Intel ME, the full Intel ME anymore. Let's see, however, a demo. So we have uh, initially the original ME image, which is, uh, as you can see, 5 megabytes. Let's run ME Cleaner on it. Here it is. Good luck. <laughs> and you can see that now the modified ME image is only 84 kilobytes. Let's see the difference between these two. You can see that uh, the original ME image has, in, in, in uh, his FPT, many partitions. The modified has only one, the FTPR. So let's dump uh, the uh, current uh, running firmware on my PC. You can see these uh, reassuring messages from my flash on. Ignore them. Everything is safe. <laughs> Let's uh, extract uh, the Intel ME firmware from the dump, OK, with IFD tool. You can see it here. You can see flash region to Intel ME dot bin, which is 84 kilobytes. Let's, conf let's compare it with uh, my modified image. You can see it's the same, so I'm running my modified image on my PC. Let's then uh, see the current status of Intel ME with Intel ME tool. So as you can see, the firmware in it uh, uh, hasn't completed. It's stuck in the initializing. And uh, as you can see in the progress phase state, uh, Intel ME has been disabled. Moreover, note uh, that uh, the response from uh, Intel ME is not complete. Uh, as, for example, Intel ME cannot uh, give you its current capabilities because uh, that part of the firmware is now gone. So what can you do? Well, you can try ME Cleaner on your, on your system. However, be careful because uh, it's uh, a bit dangerous, so you <laughs> may want to have a recover uh, way to restore your PC. If it works, well, if it doesn't work, uh, not well, but please report both of them. And uh, well, I, also, I would also like to thank uh, all these people that uh, directly or indirectly helped me in, the, in this uh, research. And uh, that's all. Yeah, here's uh, some links to our projects. Uh, you can check on my GitHub. I have uh, some uh, some tools for working with ME for extracting images. If you're interested in reverse engineering ME, I have some stuff. So you can dump the images and extract modules and disassemble them. I'm planning to I'm populating now wiki so that it will have more information about the internal structure of ME and so we can make more sense of of the disassembly. Hopefully that will help uh, people to investigate more about uh, how it works and uh, discover other things about it. And I guess, uh, yeah, we can take some questions. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Nicola.
if you would like to ask a question, please line up at the microphones. Um, in the room there are six of these, you just find the closest one. If you would like to leave, please leave to my left, your right hand side only. Thank you. Uh, is there a question from the IRC? Hello? Hello? Uh, currently not. All right. So, microphone number one, your question. Can we Intel ME access memory mapped I.O.? Memory mapped I.O.? Uh, I'm not sure. I think probably not. Because it uses DMA, and uh, I, don't, I don't think DMA works over MMIO. But uh, of course, I, I don't have currently the execution inside ME. But you can ask Maxim, maybe he can try and see if it works. He has execution in ME 11. But uh, as far as I can tell, probably not. Hope that answers the question. OK, microphone number three, your question. Uh, yes, uh, in your presentation you mentioned the word brick the laptop quite a number of times. Uh, if one actually has access to a clip-on programmer for the BIOS, how safe is this? Can you always reprogram the entire thing and recover, get everything back the way it was? Or can you actually really damage your laptop beyond repair? Okay. Uh, first of all, no laptop uh, have been armed during this... Uh, <laughs> During this research, uh, I have here my laptop. I've bricked it uh, something like uh, 40 or 45 times, uh, something like that, uh, and it's still working. So that's uh, partially answer your question. Uh, yes, if you have access, as access with uh, an external programmer and uh, you have a valid dump, you can always roll back the modifications. And that's why if you go on my GitHub page, uh, you see that I, I always recommend using an external programmer because uh, once you have a valid dump, so you, sh you should be really careful while doing your first dump, you're always safe. For example, I've uh, physically br uh, broken a SPI chip I removed it, I soldered another one, and they flashed back uh, the firmware, and it's, it's still working. So if you have uh, an external programmer, you should be always safe. Thank you. you. My phone number four, your question. Hi. Hi, great talk, first of all. Thank A you. A small mm -hmm. question. Um, does the removal of the Intel IME reduce the power consumption of the whole PC as well? A little bit, maybe, because of the reduced uh, byte size? Uh, I think so, but uh, because you don't have uh, Intel ME running anymore. But the point is that uh, Intel uh, uh, produced the Intel ME um, in such a way that uh, its impact on the power consumption uh, was minimal. So I think that the removal of its firmware shouldn't change much the situation of your PC. Yes, on the other hand, okay, I think that uh, since the clock control module is removed, you may lose the, the clock control. So, for example, the re reducing of, uh, of the processor speed that is sometimes used uh, to reduce the power may be, may be gone. So it may actually consume more power. But I don't think anyone has actually measured. So it's an open question for now. And it, I guess it depends on the, on, the, on the board, on the actual firmware, and how it's configured and so on. OK, thank you. Uh, microphone number five, what's your question? Uh, are you guys in uh, contact with the, with the Intel company? So uh, just to make, you could tell them to uh, make sure that in future on version four or something they do not start signing all of the stuff because that would make these fixes or cleanings impossible, I think. Sorry, I didn't quite get, uh, do you want them to start signing or stop signing? No, stop signing. Stop I signing. Said, oh, they, they, I mean, uh, in your talk, you mentioned that uh, certain parts were luckily not signed, but... Uh, uh, no, I, I, I said they're not encrypted for now. Yes. Well, they, they did start encrypting one module for now. They start encrypting the PAVP. And some people theorized on Twitter that it's related to some contract with Netflix. So apparently they, they want to hide some DRM keys or whatever. But the, the rest of the firmware is, is still open, so you can still uh, extract it and disassemble. So I don't think there is a plan to, to, to start encrypting the rest. It doesn't really make sense. Their uh, threat model, I think, is, does not uh, 
rely on the obfuscation. I think it's just contractual obligations that they have to decrypt that part just because of DRM. So I, th I think the, the, it will stay unencrypted for, for the foreseeable future. Um, microphone number two, your question. Um, in the slides earlier, you had some RAM area you mapped to the ME. Is this part of the main computer's RAM? And how is it reserved? How does the ME make sure the yeah, okay. actual user OS doesn't Yeah, Yes, so, so, so this is called the UMA, uh, Unified Memory Architecture. Not sure why the name. But this, is, this works uh, in a way similar to as uh, some graphic adapters work. So it takes a part of the, of the RAM of the computer and reserves for the use of, of graphical device of, for ME. And this is enforced by the chipset. So the host processor cannot access it. So yeah, it's like that. The, so the, the BIOS has to, con to configure it properly to allocate this memory and lock uh, the registers. And if BIOS does not, does not lock the registers, then you can have access to that memory in theory. And that was uh, the kind of the attack in 2009 that, that they broke the ME the first time. But for the moment, it, it's enforced by the chipset. So once the register is configured properly, you cannot access that memory from the main CPU. But in theory, you could, you could access it, uh, for example, by using hardware attack. So just by accessing the address lines on, on the RAM. However, it, it will not be enough. As I mentioned, they started in integrity check. So ME, once it gets back the memory into its own RAM, it checks if, if it has been modified. And in that case, it shuts down the, the computer. So there is protection against modification. Thank you. Uh, I'm fully aware there are still questions, but unfortunately, the time's up for this talk. Um, can people still find you for further questions on the conference, I mean? OK. Yeah, we can, yeah, if you have other questions, we can talk uh, okay. uh, on the floor. Thank you. Thank you.